I want to thank you this morning for this privilege once more of being here and opening thy word. And <clears throat> we know that the purpose of our being here is that the Holy Spirit might speak to the hearts of those who are willing to hear him. We also know, Father, that not all men are willing to hear him. Not all men can hear them. We know that there is a time in our lives when we are we will not believe, and then there comes a time when we cannot believe. The will not is because of ourselves, and the cannot is because of thee. I've been thinking, Father, of your gracious dealings with Israel, and how for so long you longed for them to hear you, and to believe you, and to know you, and love you, and for so long they would not and now, for lo, these two thousand years, they cannot, because their eyes are blinded and their ears are stopped. They see, but they do not perceive, and they hear, but they do not understand. And so, Father, we pray that those who have an ear to hear what the Spirit saith, let us hear, and let us hear gladly and joyfully, and let us receive what you have to say today because today is the only time there is, now is the only reality of our existence. And so we pray that in this now time, today, we who hear his voice will not harden our hearts, but will open them to Jesus. Pray for each person here and those who will hear the message by tape, especially some, Father, that are on our hearts this morning. For that one who's discouraged and downcast, help them to know that they are not forsaken. For those, Father, who have just sat down in the road of life and have no motivation to go on, we pray that they may again see Jesus this morning. That what they see as they look upon him will inspire them and encourage them energize them, invigorate them, that they might go on with Jesus. Pray for those who are unsaved, who are sitting in darkness. We pray they may see a great light. And when they look upon this light, they will see the face of God as it has been revealed in Jesus Christ. Pray last of all for ourselves. We need it most. We're truly less than least of all these saints and without doubt the chief of all the sinners and yet Jesus loves me. He died for me and you have justified me and neither of you condemn me. And so, Father, we pray that the Holy Spirit will speak through me what he wants to say disregarding the vessel and the man and saying freely to each of our hearts those things we need to hear from thee. Father, express in some way in reality your love for each of those here this morning in a very personal way. Help each of us to go away assured of your love. We just pray that the Lord Jesus will be more precious to us than he has ever been before because it's in his name we ask it all and for his sake alone, that he in turn may glorify thee in us. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to read a passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 12. You've been listening to me preach for very long. You're probably very much aware that this is a favorite passage of Scripture of mine because there's some portions of Scripture that says so clearly what I feel so often. It says so clearly what I need to hear so often. And this is one of them, and I come back to it time and time again, as I've often told you, like a homesick boy. And I'd like to read the first four verses of Hebrews chapter 12. Paul has just taken us on a tour in chapter 11 of what's been called the Westminster Abbey of Faith, or the Hall of Fame. And uh, the fame that these people mentioned in Hebrews 11 acquired 
was not because of anything they were and not because of anything that they did, but because of the faith that was in them, and that faith was the faith of the Lord Jesus. And so after he tells us all about some of the heroes of the past and what they accomplished by faith, <clears throat> he turns his attention again to us in chapter 12 and verse 1, we who are reading and hearing. And he says, Wherefore, seeing, or since it is a fact, that we also are compassed about with such a large mass of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, that is, reckon, weigh the cost, Count the cost. Look at him so as to compare him to you. And see that he endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. I'd like for just a moment or two to talk about myself. And uh, that's the only person I feel justified in talking about. And after I talk about myself a little while, I'd like to talk about Jesus for most of the message. And I'd like to tell you just exactly what I find in this passage for my own heart this morning. Trust it will be a blessing to you. wouldn't be too difficult to come down here and tell you that uh, I'm something I am not. And so it's easier to just come and tell you that I am what I am. And uh, for some time I've been wearied and fainting in my mind, just exactly as this passage says. I've been a little discouraged, a little down, a little depressed. Things seem like they're a little futile at times, most of the time. There re really isn't anything in the world that can encourage you as you look around. There's nothing in others that can encourage us. And least of all, there's nothing in me that can encourage me. Because when I look within and I look at you and I look at the world around me, I don't see anything there except discouragement. So it would be much easier for me to tell you that I never feel this way and that I'm always encouraged and I'm always bold and I'm always brave. That isn't the case. And uh, first of all, it's because I'm human. Uh, and secondly, it's because I have a race <clears throat> to run like all of us have passage is addressed to Christians, and he tells us what all of us know, and that is that we have a race to run. The race is the race of life. It's better described by calling it a course. It's a course that's been laid out for all of us. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, we can't see the course ahead of time. As I look, I'm glad that I can't see the course ahead of time because if I could, I'd probably die of fear and fright right on the spot. If 20 years ago, for instance, I could have seen the past 20 years ahead as clearly as I can see them now, I would never have wanted to progress past that point. But fortunately, for me at least, God hides the future from us. And he doesn't let us see our course. In fact, he doesn't even give us a map. We have no idea uh, where we're going tomorrow. We have no idea what's out there. But he doesn't leave us uh, totally forsaken. Instead of giving us a map, he has given us a guide. And the guide is someone. And this guide is Jesus. And the only thing we are to concern ourselves with is following him. Just keeping our eyes on him. Just continually looking at him because he's the only one who knows where I'm going. And since I don't know where I'm going, I would have a hard time knowing uh, when I had arrived. So it's Jesus who knows the course that's ahead of each of us and all the dangers and the trials and the temptations and the snares and the pitfalls, the discouragements and the encouragements and all of those things that are ahead of us. He's the only one who knows. 
And he doesn't reveal them to us uh, a week ahead of time, nor a day ahead of time, nor an hour ahead of time, nor a moment ahead of time. But he unfolds them moment by moment and second by second. And that inspires me, and when it doesn't inspire me, it forces me to keep my eyes on him. Not to hold on to his hand, but to let him hold on to mine. And to know that there's nothing I can do about anything except stay close to Jesus. And uh, no one ever followed the shepherd and ever got lost. And no one ever followed the truth and was ever led astray. And no one ever looked upon the face of Jesus and lost the way. So what Paul is telling us here, that we have a race to run. And the race is not to win or to lose. I've heard it expounded that way many times. There's nothing to win and there's nothing we can lose. We've already won everything. We have Jesus. And having him, we have everything there is to win. And we didn't win him by running faithfully. We won him as a free gift from God by grace and because of his love. He's given to me everything at the very beginning of this race. And therefore, I'm not running in order to get a prize. Whatever you may think about the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema, and whatever you think those crowns amount to, that's beside the point. The point is that I have already everything that God is. I have him and he himself, Jesus. And I have nothing that I can lose. I can't lose my salvation. And I can't lose Jesus. I can't lose the way. I can't lose anything of value. I can't lose anyone who's on the same course with me. Because we're all going the same way. We're all following the same one. We'll all arrive at the same place. And therefore, if there's nothing to lose and nothing to gain, we ought to enjoy the race. Now, <clears throat> the race has its hindrances. That means it isn't always easy. It wasn't easy for Paul when he was in jail with the iron on his feet and on his hands. It wasn't easy for Daniel when he was in the lion's den. It wasn't easy for Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego when they were in the fiery furnace. As I've told you so many times, the trials of faith are real. When men are tested and when they are tried and the faith that's in them is put to the test, the reality of it might be seen. God always makes the fires real and the lion's den are always real. Nobody goes into the trials and temptations of life assured ahead of time that nothing can hurt them. Because if we were assured ahead of time that nothing could hurt us, there would be no trial. But the purpose of the trial is that it might be seen in each and every experience of life and ultimately our entire lives might show that the one who is in us is faithful and that he will never leave us nor forsake us and that he who is the author and finisher of our faith will cause us to be literally seated with him where he is now through no efforts of ours and through no accomplishments of ours, but through simply his grace and his faithfulness. Now, since each of us have a race, there are hindrances. <clears throat> the hindrances, according to this passage of Scripture, come from uh, two sources. One uh, is a lack of patience, and uh, the other is that we, well, first of all, the hindrances are weights and the sin, which he specifically names here. But the symptoms of being hindered by the sin and the weights are loss of patience, and being sick and tired in your mind. Now, that's what this passage says. If you're sick and tired in your mind, that is, if you're weary in your mind and you think you're going to faint, if you've lost your patience in the race, and race simply means uh, there was a starting place and a finish place, and we're not at the finish place yet, at least not this moment. We may be soon, but not right at this precise moment. So if you're weak and, and fainting, weary in your mind, if you lost your patience, it's because the weights and the sin has gotten to you. Now, first of all, the sin is not some act. 
It's not murder or lying or stealing or adultery or profanity. The sin that's in question here is the one sin in which all other sins couch. And that's the sin of unbelief. Where he's been talking about faith. He's talking about those who were not overcome by the sin of unbelief. And the sin which doth so easily overcome us and beset us is just simply the sin of unbelief. Because when we cannot believe, we become weak and sick and faint. We become weary in our minds. We have a tendency to quit, if that were a possibility. Now, what, what gets us down are the weights. <clears throat> it's interesting that this word in the original means a bulk or mass or swelling of superfluous flesh. So that when we stop along the road of life, it's because the flesh has swelled up. We have a mass and bulk of superfluous flesh. Runners can't run when they're overweight. And as our flesh gets larger and larger, the sin of unbelief overtakes us, and we are hindered in our race. And when these symptoms appear, there is only one cure that I've ever found, and that cure is still the same. <clears throat> Twofold. Number one, we must lay aside the weights. And if we lay aside the weight, the sin of unbelief will certainly go with it. And if we can do that successfully, we can only do it by looking unto Jesus. That's the only way it can be done. You can't do it by looking at yourself. You can't do it by looking at me. And you can't do it by looking at your circumstances. You can only do it by looking to Jesus. And the kind of looking that's described in this passage is one that considers him. One that looks at him and, and reckons or weighs him or counts him against ourselves. And, and I know maybe you don't like to compare yourself to Jesus, but this is precisely what the Holy Spirit is telling me to do. Take a good long look at Jesus and then look at yourself. Look to him. The word look means up and away. It means to take your eyes off of anything that has distracted you. It means to lift them up from whatever it is you've stopped to look at, whether it's within or without, whether it's your circumstances or yourself. But first, you'll have to lift your eyes up, and then you'll have to look to Him, not just take a glance, but consider Him. Weigh Him over in your heart. Meditate on him. Think about him. I'm trying to convey to you what it means. And I won't ask you the embarrassing question, how long has it been since you spent any time just looking at him? Looking at him as so as to contemplate him. Just standing back and uh, looking at him and meditating on what you see evaluating what you see, laying what you see down as a parallel to your own life. How many, how many hours have you spent this week at it? I'm not asking you if you've quoted Scripture, and I'm not asking you if you've prayed, I'm not asking you if you've witnessed, or I'm not asking you if you've carried your Bible, or I'm not asking if you've talked to other Christians about Christian things. I'm asking you if you ever took a moment this week to just sit down and look at Jesus and think about him. Think about who he is and think about what he did. Think about what his relationship is to you and think about why he did it. And think about how he made it. And then maybe you'll come away with the answer as to how you can make it too. You come away with a solution to your problems. I was thinking this morning how we go around saying to the world without any thought at all, Christ is the answer, without ever realizing that most of us have never discovered the question. You'll not only discover the questions when you stop and look at Jesus, you'll discover the answers. So this is kind of a 
help me make it through the night message and maybe it will be a help you make it through the night too. So let's consider him. Let's look at him. You remember the Arabian proverb, I was sad when I met a man who had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. Or I was sad because I had no shoes until I met a man who had no feet. And if you're sad this morning because you have no shoes, I'd like to introduce you to the man who had no feet. And this man was Jesus. He had a course to run too. Now there was a difference between the course that he ran and the course that I must run. Many differences. First of all, my course will never end as his did. His ended in hell. Mine will end in heaven. My course will never end as his did. I will never go into eternity bearing my sins in my own body because he bore my sins in his own body. My course will never end as his because I, I will never leave this world made sin to stand before the judgment of God and to be separated for all eternity in that place which God has prepared for sin to be separated because he was made sin for me though he knew no sin that I might be made the righteousness of God in him. There are many differences between his course and mine but he had a course too. One of the big differences is that he knew ahead of time the entire course that he had to run. He knew every weary step of the way. He saw every long, trying moment and hour and day stretch out before him. Before he ever started this course, he could see all eternity past and he could see all eternity present and all eternity future. He could see the beginning from the end. He could see the first from the last. He had such perspective of the course that he must run that he could see where he was at the time in the bosom of the Father and he could see where he would end up cast behind the back of the Father forsaken and banished from the presence of the one he loved. He not only could see ahead to every experience, every word, every thought, every deed, every act, every experience, but he could see ahead to what it would cost. He could see ahead to how it would hurt. He could see ahead to how it would come out. And another difference between his course and mine is that he not only knew his from beginning to end, he had a choice as to whether he wanted to run that course or not. I never had any choice. And I was never allowed to see it. And I'm not even allowed to anticipate what might be out there ahead. Every time I've tried to anticipate, I've been wrong. God keeps me in the dark, but he was in the light. God makes me take every step by faith. He made Jesus take the whole course by faith. He had a choice. He didn't have to leave heaven to run his course. He could have stayed, and so he said in John 12, that unless a grain of wheat fall into the earth and die, it will abide alone. Simply inferring that he didn't have to die he didn't even have to come. No one made him come. He came willfully. He came joyfully. He came with a joy he spoke of often. A joy he said no man could take from him, for no man had given it to him. And a joy he said he would give to us if we wanted it. He made this choice of his own, even though it required at the very beginning of him that he renounce all that he was and all that he had, leave behind once finally and ultimately his whole place in God's eternal presence. He made that choice before he ever came to Bethlehem's manger to disguise himself as a little baby in the arms of Mary. 
and in the presence of the holy angels of God, before whom he had never been humbled, for to be humbled implies inferiority. And in the presence of God and of the cherubims and the seraphims, these holy creatures who stood around and proclaimed the holiness of God, and in the presence of God the Father, and in the power and energy of the Holy Spirit, the eternal Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, willfully, joyfully, and with love, humbled himself, not only at the feet of God, but at the feet of the angels. For a little season he was made what? Lower than the angels, that he might know what it was like to be a man. And that he might do for man what man couldn't do for himself. And upon finishing his work, he might sit down at the right hand of God and see both sides, my side and God's, and help me not only to be saved for all eternity, but to help me make it through the long night of my waiting until I am made like him. Let us consider him. He had a race. No man ever ran such a race as he ran. The race that was laid out for him included every obstacle and every hindrance and every hurt and every sorrow and every grief that every man of every age will ever experience in his own private, personal course of life. If my course included ten obstacles, then his course included ten times as many as have lived in the human race and will live until he comes. If my race has ten temptations, he had ten times, ten thousand times, ten thousand thousands more. If mine has ten sorrows, his had a multitude more. <clears throat> if mine had ten griefs, his had a multitude more. If I've been hurt ten times, he was hurt a multitude of times. His course was mine and yours and every man's all put together and jammed into an earth time space of 33 years. If ever a man ran the gauntlet, he ran the gauntlet. And the gauntlet included every sorrow, every grief, every heartbreak, every pain, every hurt, every temptation, every trial, every discouragement, every depression, everything that all men's lives have included from the beginning of the human race until the end of the human race. And he ran it all, yet he didn't have to. Let us look at him. Though his race was more severe than mine, <laughs> not even worthy to be compared to his is mine. Yet I say this in the boldness of faith, because I know in my heart that it's so. He was never hindered as he ran this race. He never lost his patience. He never became discouraged. He never got despondent. He never experienced or expressed self-pity. He never slumped into bitterness and resentment. Never did he seek vengeance on his own, but only promised that in good time God would deal justly with all men about him. Not a single time did he ever sit down along the road of life and say what I've said a thousand times, I can't make it, and so I quit. And a thousand times I've said in my heart, and so have you, <clears throat> but if he had only had to endure what I have to endure, if he had only had to withstand what I've had to withstand, and then we've always copped out by adding, and anyway, he was God, and I'm not God. Hear me very reverently when I say to you that for the 33 years of his life, he wasn't God either. That is, he wasn't God in this sense, 
though He was the eternal Son of God, before He came, while He was here, and forever, He relinquished and gave up all of His rights when He came to the human race and was willing to pass His lifetime doing what He did in the power and energy of the Holy Spirit, not by the rights of the Son of God. He, for instance, said, I could call twelve legions of angels, but he didn't. Obedient unto the death of the cross, he subject himself to the will of his Father. And upon entering the human race, he made this statement, not for me, but for God. I come to do thy will, O God. He came resigned to do the will of God. And he walked life as serenely, as peacefully, as quietly, and as joyfully as I could ever dream about. And he did it with this quiet confidence. My father has laid out the course, and I have come to do my father's will. Therefore, there's nothing to change and nothing to fight and nothing to worry about. There's nothing to do but to walk each day in the joyful presence and fellowship of my Father and rest in His eternal love. Isn't that an easy way? <coughs> Let me tell you a little bit about what He endured. <coughs> First of all, I'm just trying to stick with my text. I could roam over the Scriptures and find many other sidelights to this particular thought, but... I want to stay here in the text if I can. First of all, he endured, according to this passage of Scripture, what is called here the contradiction, the contradiction of sinners against himself. And that's hard to take. The contradiction, the word contradiction means gainsaying. And for 33 years he endured the continual gainsaying of sinners. First of all, marvel over that word sinners. It's easier to endure the contradiction of those who have grounds, or at least self-imagined grounds, to contradict you and to gainsay you. But when you have to receive such treatment at the hand of those who are sinners, when you yourself are the holy and righteous Son of God who never knew sin, that's hard to take. And sinners followed him around from day one. And they never left him until the moment he left his body to be separated from God at the cross of Calvary. They taunted him. They mocked him. They lied about him. They jeered him. They mistreated him with words, twisted everything that he said until the very last word he uttered and the very last breath he drew. Yet he endured every word of it, knowing that it originated with the sinners he came to save. He withstood or the word here is resisted, he stood against or resisted for 33 years the sin. He strove against it. And I do believe, and I don't know what I'm saying, but God knows that the sin he strove against and the sin he resisted and the sin he withstood without ever succumbing to it was the sin of unbelief. sin of unbelief. Else why in the garden of Gethsemane an intimate part of his agony is described in the fifth chapter of Hebrews when it tells us that he prayed and he besought God and the passage brings out how it was with strong crying and with tears how he wept 
and how he begged God in the Garden of Gethsemane to reassure him of his promise that he would deliver him out of death, that he would not leave his soul in hell, not suffer his Holy One to see corruption. What was he battling with? What was he striving with? Resisting, standing against the sin of unbelief that couched like an angry lion at the door of his heart, saying, God will forsake you forever. God will never bring you back from among the dead. God will leave your soul in hell and he'll see his Holy One corrupted. And God will forget you. And the gates of Hades will close about you forever and you'll never see your Father's face again. Do you think the devil ever told him anything like that? Of course he did. For 33 years he strove against this sin every day, every hour, every moment. The sin of unbelief that would tempt him to use his own rights as the Son of God and so not do the will of his Father. The sin of unbelief that tempted him every moment of the day to prove that he truly was God and to justify himself in the eyes of men who continually contradicted him and put him down. And then the Scripture says that he endured the cross. And he was so victorious at the cross. Oh, what a victory. He'd go there and stand at the cross with the full knowledge of who he was and what he was doing and then for whom he was doing it. And what a victor he was. I was just refreshed the other day and coming across the little word for crown. And I was reading the story of how they took Jesus to Pilate's judgment hall and how they took him away to the soldiers' quarters and how they beat him and how they whipped him and how someone in, in derision said, let's, let's make a crown for this king. And so they went out and they, they took the thorns and they formed a crown for him and they came in and they jammed it on his brow. And never a crown had such, such beauty as that. And never a crown so announced a victory like that crown did. Because when the Holy Spirit described the crown which they made for Jesus, He used a word which means a crown of victory, though they meant it for a diadem or a sovereign's crown. They were mocking His claim that He was king. And so they said, we'll make a king's crown for him. And they put it on his brow. But when the Holy Spirit described it, he said it was a Stephanus, a crown of victory. For he was victor over all his enemies in his silence. Oh, as he stood there enduring the cross, the Scripture says he despised its shame. And the Greek word brings out a beautiful word picture. He stood there at the cross and then hung at the cross, all the while looking down his nose at the shame of it, counting it nothing for the joy, the joy that was his. He endured and he withstood, and then he endured the worst of all, the cross and its ultimate banishment from the presence of the one who was life itself to him. And I tell you that from this scripture, and if you don't understand this statement just now, maybe you will a little later, joy carried him through. And we have to find out something about what this joy is. Now let's go back over the course we came to. We came on here. <coughs> I hope all you people, and I'm talking to myself, who feel sorry for yourself, will feel so sorry for Jesus that you'll forget about feeling sorry for yourself. In 1 John, where John writes much about Jesus, he uses a little word in 1 John 3, 1. He says the world never knew him. And in the original language, he meant that the world, by experience, couldn't understand him and didn't understand him. 
And I brought a message not long ago called Someone Understands. I try to show you the difference between understanding and misunderstanding and not understanding. And I want to talk about misunderstanding because I didn't touch too much on it in my message. And I want to say first right off that Jesus, who came to do what he did for his Father, that his Father might do for me what he has done. He was the most misunderstood human being who ever appeared on the human scene. He wasn't misunderstood a few times or several times. He was continually misunderstood from the day he was born until the day he died. The world around him missed the entire significance of his appearance. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the misunderstandings that he endured for he endured it at the hand of sinners. I don't suppose there's anything that strikes at the heart of a man and gets him down much quicker than being misunderstood. And I don't know of anything that rises more quickly out of my breast, at least, than the impulse to take away that misunderstanding, to justify myself, to prove to those who misunderstand me that they're wrong, but I want to show you a man who was misunderstood from the day he was born until the day he died. Never one time did he succumb to the impulse to justify himself, defend himself, or explain himself. He was either an awful moral coward, he either had an awful lot to hide and they were right about him, or else he had a joy that didn't make it necessary. And that's what we're going to talk about. They misunderstood him when he was born. How could any good thing come out of Galilee to start with, or out of Nazareth? If he was everything he said he was, why was he born in a manger? Surely if God was to enter the human race, he'd come in Herod's palace. Or he'd come in Caesar's throne. But who ever heard of such a ridiculous thing as God choosing to come into the human race and masquerade as a man, and choosing to be born of poor people, laid in a manger in a stable, and choose as his place of birth, and later as his place of residence, the most insignificant, worthless place in the whole world. They misunderstood the manner of his birth, They called his mother a whore, pardon my strong language. And some of the theologians of the mystery of iniquity called professing Christianity today have labored long and hard to prove that Jesus as a man was the illegitimate child of a blonde mercenary German soldier who had come to the Holy Land to fight. So the world thinks no more of him today than they thought then. Misunderstood? Do you realize the shame that that misunderstanding brought to his precious mother, who was a virgin when in her womb there was conceived this holy thing by the power of God? Can you understand the life of silence she had to live? when only she and God knew the truth. And I've told you before, the greatest argument in the world for the proof and the truthfulness of the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ is in the fact that basically he died under the criminal charge that he was the Son of God and that he was God himself. And all Mary had to do to save him from the cross of Calvary was speak up and say, Hey, all of these things he said are lies. I'll introduce you to his father. I know when he was conceived and who conceived him. But she stood at the cross in silence while he said to John, Behold thy mother. And she never opened her mouth to correct the lifetime of lies that had been told about him and her. Do you know why? 
because he was born without a human father. And because she was a virgin when she conceived him. And because the holy thing that was formed in her womb was a precious baby's body to be occupied by the eternal God. She knew it. The angel who told her knew it. And Jesus knew it. And that's all that mattered on the earth. Can you imagine somewhat the shame that this misunderstanding brought to a good man named Joseph? A good man who knew in his heart that Mary had never known a man. A good man who lived, and nobody knows what happened to Joseph. His death is not recorded in the Bible. There's no mention of him after the childhood of Jesus. And my mind runs off with me when I try to speculate. But even men, you know, can die of broken hearts. And here was a good man who lived all the years that he lived, how many only God knows, but he lived with the stigma of raising a bastard son. And he lived with the stigma of being married to a woman who came to his marriage bed pregnant with child. And he lived with the stigma of this beloved Jesus being the seed of fornication and a child of Beelzebub. You say, well, that wasn't Jesus suffering at all. Don't you think he felt the grief of Mary? Don't you think he shared the heartbreak of Joseph? Don't you think it was a temptation to him when these charges were heard in his hearing? Don't you think it was a temptation for him to speak up and tell what he knew? Misunderstood in his birth, misunderstood in his conception, misunderstood... <coughs> In the experiences of his mother, misunderstood in his relationship to Joseph. He was misunderstood in his own relationship to his parents. How could a child be so holy and just and say to his parents when but 12 years of age, Why, why are you surprised? I have to do with my father's business. It's here in the temple. How could a man so holy and so just willfully disobey his parents, cause him so much grief and heartache, and stay behind in the temple when a child? Everything he did was misunderstood, and everything he said was twisted around. Even his home life was a terrible nightmare of misunderstanding and false accusation. His brothers didn't believe in him. And when I speak of his brothers, I speak of his half-brothers. It's assumed that he had half-brothers and sisters. Some of them are named. These were children born to Mary after the birth of Jesus. They never believed in him. And it means then that if they did not believe in him, they did believe what others believed about him. He lived in a home where every member of that home, with the exception of his precious mother and his father, if he was still alive when he grew to manhood, that is, his earthly father, he lived in a home where not a soul except his precious mother believed that he was anything but an illegitimate son, a wild-eyed fanatic, an insane prophet, a mad rebel, rabble rouser. They believed what the world believed about him, that the devil had sent him, and that the devil inspired him. And they feared him like others feared him, feared him because he was a dangerous man, a paranoid, a schizophrenic, a psychopath who might go berserk at any time. A man who many times was counted mad and his own brethren more than once in the Scriptures came to take him away forcibly because they feared that he had lost his mind entirely. He lived with 33 years of this. Read in the Psalms as I've so often reminded you. Some of the Psalms are precious because they're 
the experiences of Jesus while he was here on the earth given to the psalmist by the spirit of prophecy years before he lived. And read some of the heart-rending psalms, the messianic psalms, where he pours out his heart to God in the night. The 69th is one of my favorites. Read it when you go home. How night after night he turned his face to the wall, conscious that there was no one there but him and God, and found in God enough. Read the 69th Psalm and see how he wept himself to sleep. And how when he walked in the city streets and in the marketplaces, he walked proud, yet he heard with his ears the drunken songs that followed him, the awful accusations that never left him, the awful condemnation that was heaped upon him day after day after day behind his back, don't you think that he knows the frustration of saying to himself, but it's lies. Why doesn't someone show them the truth? No, dear friend, he understands. He knows. But he also knows what I forget, that those who contradicted him, gainsayed him, <laughs> mocked him, jeered him, accused him, and condemned him weren't seeking for the truth. They were trying to kill the truth, for he was the truth. Misunderstood at home, misunderstood even by his disciples. There was the man who followed him and believed in him who understood him. He did such unreasonable things. It went far beyond him. When the zeal of his father's house consumed him inside. And there in the temple that day he began with his scourge to drive out the money changers and declare that this was his father's house, that they had turned it into a den of thieves. I'm not sure that the disciples could cope with that. When he talked about the cross, they contradicted him and told him, no, never to think of such a thing as that. When he took them to Gethsemane with him to stand by him as he prayed, because the human part of him longed for the fellowship and the closeness of someone who might understand and someone who might hold the ropes while he went down into the deepest well of history. And they fell asleep. In the night of his betrayal, when the human part of him would have longed for Peter to have walked with him in the judgment hall and said... What I said before, I say again, this is the Son of God. He's the Messiah, and if he goes down, I go down with him. Yet Peter stood outside and said, I say with an oath, I know not the man. I never knew him. You see, Peter was a sinner too. And he withstood all of this throughout the years of his life. How would you like to spend the mature years of your life speaking the word of truth and knowing that every word that came from your mouth came first from the heart of the Father. And know that every word you spoke, you had heard it first in the presence of your Father. And know that every word you spoke was twisted and perverted and warped out of shape and was restated until what was stated was a lie and not the truth. You have a little bit of that in your life. How would you like every word stolen from your lips as soon as it was uttered and turned into a lie and thrown back in your face? He quietly and gently said over and over again, the words that I speak, they're not mine. They're my father's. And men rose up around him and said, these be the words of a madman. These are the words of Beelzebub, and in effect they were saying, whoever your father is, he's Beelzebub. Whoever your father is, he's as mad as you are. And all the words you're speaking, they're lies, lies, lies. The Pharisees in the later months of his life hired batteries of lawyers, literally lawyers. 
These lawyers had one ministry and they had one purpose. They were to follow him about wherever he was, listen to his words, and then twist them and make from these twisted words traps that would ensnare him. So everything that came out of his mouth, it was twisted around and thrown back at him. And they would say, you say this. But it wasn't what he said at all. The lawyers followed him around through the closing months of his life, studied at night by the oil lamp, twisting what they had heard today into an accusation to make tomorrow. You get upset because people talk about you? You get upset because others gossip about you? You shouldn't. Most of what they say is true. You get upset over it? You shouldn't. They never left him alone. Never. The words that he spoke, they were the words of eternal life. You know, I want to preach about truth before long, maybe tonight at the meeting, I'm not sure. But I will tell you a wonderful distinction that I learned. There is the truth, and then there's the word of truth. And the word of truth is not the truth. It's the word about the truth. But if the word of truth is faithful, and you believe it, it's just as real as the truth itself. God is the truth. And Jesus was the word of that truth. And I'll tell you what truth is. It's reality. It's the actual state of things as they are. And Jesus had been in the presence of God. He knew him as he actually was. He experienced the reality of the eternal God. And he came out to give the word of that truth he knew. Yet every word... And with every word went the opportunity and the privilege and the blessing for every man who heard it to simply believe it and have the same reality of God that he had. Yet they took the word which he gave and molded it and fashioned it into a lie and sent the message back to the Father through him. We think of you exactly what we think of him. Let me talk a little bit more about what this man endured. They even misunderstood his looks. I've talked to you about this before. Do you know what the common opinion was among the people of his time? They said that he had been cursed by God. That his outward appearance told them that he had been cursed by God. That God's hand was on him in affliction in a heavy way. There were a couple of things that made him think that. One was the way he looked. And in the end of his life, they were positive of it. Because he died without a son. And he had no one to propagate his name. <laughs> Yet here stands a man in this poor union hall 2,000 years ago propagating his name, carrying on his family, and testifying that he indeed is mine and I am his, and I was born of this man as surely and truly as any man was ever born of any man. This concludes part one of CS 83, Consider Jesus. For the continuation of this message, please follow the link to CS 83, part two, Consider Jesus, Conclusion.